This is the fifth and culminating week of Gospels, which refer to the Eucharist. The Eucharist is important, indeed central, to Catholicism. But that string of Gospels can seem a little disjointed. That is why the opening lines of today's Gospel prompt the obvious question, what teaching did the apostles find hard to accept? Let's answer that by reading select verses leading to today's Gospel. The bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. The Jews quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, Amen, amen, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life within you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. The one who feeds on me will have life because of me. The disciples said, This saying is hard. Who can accept it? And Jesus said, Does this shock you? As a result of this, many of his disciples returned to their former way of life and no longer accompanied him. Jesus then said to the twelve, Do you also want to leave? Simon Peter answered him, Master, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. To secular society listening only with physical ears, this may sound repugnant, both now and in Jesus' time, perhaps even cannibalistic. That's why in today's gospel some disciples said, this is saying is hard, who can accept it? So was Jesus speaking in a parable? We recall in Matthew when Jesus' disciples asked him to explain what he meant by the sower and his seed. He immediately gave an explanation. But in today's gospel, Jesus actually lets his followers leave. He doesn't say, hey, stop, wait a minute, this was a parable, let me explain. No, he just lets them leave. The early church interpreted these Eucharistic passages literally. Historians from the second century on documented that the twelve apostles believed that Christ was fully present in the Eucharist. They included Ignatius of Antioch, Justin Martyr, Arrhenius, Clement of Alexandria, Tertullian, Origen, Cyril of Jerusalem, Augustine, and others. Even renowned present-day Protestant theologians like J.D. Kelly confirmed those early beliefs. And continuously for almost 2,000 years since the Twelve Apostles, Catholics have believed in Christ's real presence. Even Martin Luther believed in the real presence. After his 16th century Reformation, most of the resulting about 34,000 Christian denominations don't believe in the real presence of the Eucharist, only that it is a symbol. In spite of early historians and clear biblical texts, the four Gospels and St. Paul's first letter to Corinthians. Some have refused to believe by deferring to science, which shows that the bread and wine remain chemically unchanged. The Eucharist is a mystery not explainable by science. In fact, science can't even explain 96% of the universe, which is dark energy and matter, 95% of the brain, which is unconscious, and over 60% of the 11 plus dimensions of the universe. In fact, science believes in an uncertainty principle, which states that the universe itself, by its very nature, is not completely knowable. Our brain often overestimates itself in life. The Holy Spirit dwelling in us is the only source of eternal life. At times, we may all be like doubting Thomas when Jesus had to invite him to put his hand into his side to convince him to believe. Instead, we are being invited to taste with our tongues the body and blood of Christ, to taste and see the goodness of the Lord as we sing at Mass. God made us both physical and spiritual beings. That is why sacramental Eucharistic union is both physical and spiritual. God seeks us to be in union with him when he invites us at every Mass to receive him in communion. 
Jesus wants us to experience divine union, both physical and spiritual, both symbolically and substantively, which is the very definition of a sacrament, both symbol and substance of his love. This combination may seem hard to reconcile, but even science talks about the same reality in different ways when it describes light as both a particle analogous to substance and a wave analogous to symbol. So looking at Jesus as the light of the world, we are seeing in the Eucharist both Jesus' substantive presence and symbolic nourishment. We are dealing with the most important sacrament in the Catholic Church, so significant and fundamental to our beliefs that it is used in conjunction with all the other sacraments. Receiving the Eucharist is even a form of reconciliation, forgiveness of sin. Jesus was a true revolutionary, a word that means not violence but dramatic change. Jesus turned things upside down. The Old Testament often referred to God as angry, but Jesus said God is love. The tradition was to seek God, and Jesus said God seeks us. The practice was to offer burnt animal sacrifices to placate God, but Jesus offered the sacrifice of God himself to profoundly demonstrate his love. Humans founded many religions, but Jesus, God himself, founded Christianity. The teaching was that God was transcendent, but Jesus said God dwells within us. The belief was that God consumed us as punishment, but Jesus says we consume God in Eucharist. No one in their wildest imagination could have ever conceived of a God and religion in these revolutionary ways except God himself. We receive the Eucharist in communion, which derives from two words, calm meaning with and union meaning together with each other and with Christ. We are then in calm unity with each other, grateful for Christ's gift of himself to us. The word Eucharist comes from the Greek meaning grateful. We are grateful for God dwelling within all of us. God is just as present in the Eucharist as he is within us as the Holy Spirit. A French friend invited us over for dinner and spoke of his dessert being the best in the world. He was not normally prone to braggadocio. He said that he used the best ingredients, including his blood, sweat, and tears, and his body and soul. In divine terms, he put his body and blood into this dessert. Finally, the moment came, the pièce de résistance. As the French say, the presentation was sublime. Presentation hits four of the five senses, smell, touch, sight, and sound. In divine terms, it was benediction as we had last Wednesday here at our prayer service. But then came the potential coup de grace moment, the taste. We had three choices for our reaction. The first, we could say we were unworthy of such decadent gastronomical ingredients, but the host would have been offended. He didn't question whether we were worthy, but gave lovingly. In divine terms, we were, being inviting, we were being invited to eat the, eat the body and blood of the divine chef himself. The second choice was to think this couldn't be the best dessert ever. Psychologically, this is setting the dessert up for failure. Science says that we are being controlled by unconscious confirmation bias. That is, we will only taste that which confirms our preconceived ideas. In divine terms, we are the apostles and some Christian denominations who leave and the unbelievers who disingenuously receive and not believe. Either way, we never fully taste the divine dessert. The third choice is we have an open mind and open heart to trust the chef. After all, he has performed miracles with food before. The divine chef performed many miracles, not the least of which was becoming both God and man. Entering with his open mindset enables full union with God. Like the consummation of sacramental marital union, the consummation of sacramental divine union is receiving Eucharist physically and spiritually. We are then open to allowing God to enter us contemplatively. 
The divine chef has put his divine presence in our mouth, thus eliminating the possibility of words, and in our hearts, thus eliminating the need for thoughts. Once we are given that experience, we will never leave him.